Hey, what's up, Troy? What's up, Mark? This is a long time coming, man. This is a this is a thing. This is a thing. This is a thing that has been a long time coming. Uh, I say it every episode, but I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, your story, where you're at right now, what you're doing, the the kind of ground that you're breaking, the initiatives that you're taking on, it's all. It's like they say, if your life was a movie, would anybody want to watch it? The answer is yes, yes. So introduce yourself to the people. Let them know where you're at in the world right now. What's up, amazing humans? I'm Troy Sandage, also known to some as a strategy hacker and to others as probably the Energizer Bunny at events. I've uh, been a growth marketing strategist for a long time. 15 years experience in B2B tech, SaaS. I started off electrical engineering, went to digital media, went to social media, we're into growth marketing and just leveled up and all these things. I'm stacking up them bricks, y'all. <laughs> and so now I've been doubling down on realizing, you know what? I really want to take events, immerse experiences, and make it matter more to brands, especially post-COVID. People see and are desperate for human connection, mm. you know, and how do we create those experiences, whether in the physical sense, the digital sense, or the social sense, to help brands catapult, but also create community that's equitable that's inclusive for many um to experience the same type of dynamic in brains yeah and and you 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 baked it in there but the diversity <laughs> equity inclusion and belonging is the cornerstone of where you're doing and what's interesting is you like you you again you laid out your kind of career path in less than 20 seconds but you've you've come from a place where you've not only learned, but you've led, right? You, you learned these things as a growth hacker. You've learned as a marketer, as trends developed, you learn the trends, but then you also blazed your own trail and created your own trends. And we're going to talk about all that because I think it's interesting to people that listen to this, to think about where you're at right now in your life, whether that's challenge, whether it's, what do they say? Striving or thriving, right? Um, you know, there's always an opportunity to reinvent yourself. There's always an opportunity to grow. And Troy, you're like a huge example of that. So again, folks, if they don't know, you can find Troy online. He's always at find Troy on the socials. Uh, we are going to talk about your new venture that you started last year. Was it? Yes. Yes. And uh, we were going to get into all of that, but first take us back to where it all started. They hear people hear your voice. They see your face right now. They probably see online anyway. Where are you from originally? What was it like growing up for you? Because I want to start to dig into how you got to be this open-minded, you know, this kind of uh, individual that really perseveres through challenge and then just blazes trails where you go. Where'd you grow up and how did it all start? Well, if you take two packs of bacon, a golf ball, and a quarter, that's how much I weighed when I was born. If you do the math, two pounds, two ounces, born three months premature. But... Um, so let that sit in for a minute. Clearly, from the moment I was appeared in this planet, I'm fighting. So um, that should be a premise for the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, born from a blue collar family uh, out of Northwest Indiana, but really suburbs of Chicago, basically at that point. So um, you know, it's all about putting in the work. And I had I have really good parents who um, instilled in me a probably ridiculous work ethic. <laughs> <laughs> um, my dad had a lot of grace in other areas. My mother would push me, you know, hey, you're at 99%, let's get to 100%. You know, hey, mm -hmm. let's get better. Let's articulate our words better. Let's do our math better. It's always pursuit. Um, and that instilled in me and how I pursued what I would do. And so when I pursued one to be electrical engineer, um, you know, I realized it's not where I wanted to go, but the tangibles of electrical engineer, the analytical, uh, mm -hmm. thought process the um the ability to just surpass failure i mean if you ever work with microprocessors and other components of units and doing this a million times of certain i was electrical engineering so doing all these different things to make one thing blink in sequence <laughs> 100 yeah. times and it has to be perfect goodness i don't even want to talk how much i stayed in gellerson um just making something work but that just instilled in me so many different things that I take with me, as I like to call life stacking, you know, skill yeah. stacking. You know, it's not like you're replacing, you're adding on the seasoning and the layers and all that. And I think from looking at where I was raised, how I was raised, and obviously um, as a BIPOC entrepreneur, creator, marketer, all those things, I've developed so many layers of looking at the world from a lens of 
you know, appreciate uh, being appreciative. I, I think it's a privilege, Mark, to do what we do. 100%. It's a privilege to have technology and be in a way where we can be in anywhere in the world and have a conversation and show our skill sets to the world and be like, Mark, you here. Like I was just telling Mark, um, green screen room, I've been seeing him so much learning different HubSpot things. And I'm like, I know you, I know you. I was like, do you know, do you know? But I know, I'm get to know you. And I think the technology thing just helps. But segueing back into everything, I think the journey has allowed me to not only appreciate my skills, but cultivate them and apply it to a, a greater good. Mm. I went up the corporate ladder with the intent, oh, I need to get to a higher level to then help people behind me break through those barriers, break through those things. And I think as we've grown now, post-pandemic, five generations in the workforce, um, more people are smarter. They're more purpose-driven. They're not settling for less, nor should they yeah. ever have to. I think now everything is catching up where we as business owners, we as marketers, we as creatives need to wake up and acknowledge it's not just about creating or producing or driving a product or offering. It's not enough to just exchange the money. It's exchanging the value and make sure it aligns to what the people need. What that song goes, give the people what they want. Give the people and what so they I want. I think DIBA is kind of that, that premise for that. For people that don't know, what's DIBNA? Diversity, equity, inclusion, belongingness, and accessibility. And what does that mean? So when you look at diversity, it represents you know the different perspectives and experiences, different groups, whether you're looking at ethnic, uh, ethnical groups, race, identity, gender, all the other categories that you want to quantify. It's just a smorgasbord diverse, and it was coming to the table. Then when you switch into Equity, it's really about addressing those barriers and those biases so we can have balance. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone can start at the race, but is it equity, equitable, and how you want to apply it? Then you go into inclusion, it's taking that and make sure everyone feels valued. It's one thing to say everyone has the same, but do you feel valued? Do you feel part of that? And that leads into belongingness, where you have a sense of community where your identity is not only acknowledged but it's included you're considered and then when you go into accessibility it's you know it's the technological things the materials everything that allows whatever your challenges or non-challenges are you can all experience the same level of touch experience to the, the equivalency of what you may have or what you may desire so it's usable for the people with abilities um, and broadening audience engagement. So it's not just secular to just one particular group of people. And so if you look at DEIBA as a circular whole, all five of those components are critical now and essential for us to look at these things. And the ironic thing of all of this, mm -hmm. to be good at it, you have to actually apply all of these things to be good at it because otherwise we'd be biased. We don't have everything within ourselves to apply this. We have to actually join forces with other people, not compete, collaborate with other people to allow this inclusiveness and equitable ways to transfer in whatever it is that you're doing. And I think it's the beautiful thing and ironic thing of it is that we need to consider humans and we need humans to help other humans to be better humans. That's my question. So this is a th <clears throat> This is the way it should be, but it clearly was not always the way that it was, right? And and you can think about that in any any lifestyle, any business, anything, and relationships, they've changed, right? They're just, we learn as we get older, we learn. As the world evolves, we learn new things. And this 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 field of work, the way to, to look at the world around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, this is... It's something that we are now, it's defined. There is process, there's framework. However, it's kind of being like, it's like plumbing. It's like, hey, plumbing's great, but you need somebody to do the plumbing. I don't know how to do plumbing. So how do people, uh, again, folks that are listening to this that might have, you know, 
be at the sea level of a large organization, or maybe they're a small uh, entrepreneur, or they're an independent contractor, or they have nothing to do with business, and they just have relationships in their life and other things. What does it look like to start to put this into practice? Meaning we are aware that this exists. When it does get implemented, we see lots of tangible, amazing outcomes. But how do people get from like becoming aware to be actually implementing to seeing the success? What do people do for this? For starters, you need to listen. And that honestly is the most powerful thing you can do and probably the most uncomfortable thing for most people to do. Because it'll, if to do active listening properly in this space, you have to allow yourself to let go of what you hold to be the source of truth to consider other people's sources of truth as well. And then reincorporate your source of truth in the midst of all of that. Hmm. And believe it or not, we can be very defensive of our own norms. And that's normal. That's okay. This is a tough conversation. It is not easy. If it was easy, we would have had this all done, that's figured right. out. People hear DIBA and it's like, ooh, sometimes. Or they may only think from the surface level of PR. They may just think, oh, well, we have a diverse team. We have a diverse policy. You know, we put it in our hiring thing at the bottom. You know, cool. We're HIPAA compliant on these things. That's like very, very, very basic surface level. That's like you making eggs and we trying to go for a whole full five, you know, category buffet thing. Five star like, meal over you here. You can't just buy the gym <laughs> membership. You can't just get the card. Like, I Come got on a gym now, membership. That doesn't do anything. You got to put on, in the look, work. You're and showing it, a card. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you got to put gym? in the work. Did you put in the work? Right, right. right. <laughs> so you're saying listening is kind of like the first step, right? And when you, yes. I, what I heard you say is when you listen, it's not just about hearing what people say. It's like that uh, from the movie White Men Can't Jump. He's like, you can hear, you're listening to Jimmy, but you can't hear Jimi Hendrix, right? So it's like listening is not just, hearing words it's interpreting it's asking questions it's it's like looking for deeper meaning and you said that it's uncomfortable for people because to be a good active listener you have to let go of what you believe to be the truth which i think is a really hard thing for people to do Very hard because hard. as you get older in your years a lot of people get stuck in their ways uh we've been institutionalized to think that a certain thing the the, the world is the way just this is the way the world is, and we need to be open to a new opportunity, a new, a new set of uh, eyes, if you will, a new set of ears to hear things and to see things. It, to me, it sounds like the act of listening is, is this entry point into empathy building. And yes. empathy building yes. is like this – again, I'm the king of bad metaphors, right? But it's like if we're going to talk metaphors. about like go. buying a gym membership, it's like first you need to find out that gyms even exist. And that you have a problem that you ne you need to like lower the cholesterol or what have you. Right. So as people, you know, again, I always like to think, Troy, that like I say, there's a lot of buses in the world. And what I mean is that when we get done with this interview, if I step out here on a Peterson Avenue, I get smacked by the 85A bus. I want people to leave with value right away. So we're we're 12 minutes into the conversation. People that are listening, one thing you should start doing immediately is start asking good questions and listening to diverse perspectives. Um, man, this makes me think of my buddy, Brian. I got to tell you this. It is the funniest thing. Let's go. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to out him. I have a good friend, Brian. He's a partner at one of the uh, big three and he uh, has been there forever. And he is the kindest, most genuine, empathetic and honest human being I know. In probably about 12 years ago, he told me he went to um, a workshop on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion at the time uh, because his company was leading a lot of this work. Yeah. And they did an activity where they gave you little uh, pieces of round pieces of paper. Some were brown, some were yellow, some were white. It was to represent skin colors and race. And he said, they said, okay, uh, think about all of your friends, right? Uh, what, which dot represents the color of most of your friends and then your colleagues and your neighbors and the people you shop by. And he said, when I looked down, I realized it was all my race. It was all white. I didn't have any, there was no diversity r related to race in my life. And he said he was at the gym that night and there's a gentleman that he would always see at the gym, African-American gentleman. And they would always give a hello, you know, a little, you know, you do that weird, like, you know, smile. And he took this, this, this dude is the great, talk about how, 
his heart was in the right place. But he finally went up to this gentleman. And he said, hey, my name's Brian. I did this activity at work and I realized I don't have any friends uh, from diverse races or cultures. Do you want to grab coffee sometime? And the guy was like, what? And they went and had coffee. And it was amazing. But the idea is that being aware that there could be a different perspective, being aware that we always have opportunity to grow and taking that uncomfortable step, maybe don't approach people in the gym and just say, hey, we're coffee. a different race. Can we talk? I don't know if that's how we go about it. Um, how should people, though, Troy, how should people go about starting that journey? Because before we get to listening, what does it look like for people to become aware that they are not being as diverse as they can and they can gain so much value from it? I like to think people, to your point, you be in various groups. And sometimes this is very easy to do when you, can, when you confront a wall or an obstacle. Sometimes we can get stuck in these things and we're doing all the things that we know how to do to try to combat this. And the one thing we haven't done is taking ourselves out of the situation and saying, who else has dealt with this? And do they know of a better way to apply this? And before I go any further, I do want to acknowledge and hit a pause for a quick second. In this work and these conversations, it's not meant to say because X amount of your friends or employees or whatever are of a certain type or demographic, you are immediately X, Y, Z, because that is very, there are so many other variables involved where you live, yeah, social yeah. economic status, education, no all those different things. Equation, right? There's no like, <laughs> Do this and you get this, right? There's no set number. And we're not, order. another thing I want to be, is the other extreme, we're not here to assemble the Power Rangers. If you know what I mean by that, you know what I mean by that. That is not right. the intent either because that's can, wrong. Can you just clarify for people? I know what you mean. Let people know, <laughs> what, why don't we want to assemble the Power Rangers? It's not about having a rainbow effect to just check off boxes visually right. or literally to say, look, you all, we're so this because the front page of our homepage shows every nationality imaginable and one of the worst stock photos ever created. But we're going to count it as towards our things. But I digress. We're not going to go there, Mark. We're not going to go there. But if y'all know the context, you can feel you understand. <laughs> I know that stock image. We're all around <laughs> a whiteboard looking. We're all, we're all standing at the executive chair. And it's all, it's like, it's like the United Nations. It's like that. That's not what we're going for here. And right. why, why is that not the approach? Because it's not real. It's not real. Come on. 90% of those people aren't even of the same <laughs> equality in title and pay and i can go down the rabbit hole y'all we want to go that side of it we can but we're trying to give y'all the breadcrumbs and the introductory one-on-one -on -one level of this and why right. is it tangible to business and life and all of those things um i like to say this and we, we have it on uh season three's website um diversity equals revenue inclusion equals innovation and community equals sustainability and I always say diversity equals revenue because you're allowing yourself to have different people of different walks of life to different vantage points to approach this problem or add more value as a solution um, growth process. And I also think when you're more inclusive, it literally forces you to be more innovative. And if you look at the brands, if you look at the leaders who are actually doing it big, I'm not talking about these legacy folk who did one thing and we holding their names high and they ain't made no changes in 20 years and we still quoting about them and they just go around off legacy of credit points that they did in the early days of social, early days of YouTube. I'm not talking about those people. I'm not talking about those people. Right. But if you look at the, the next generation, the people who are really breaking those barriers, they are embracing inclusivity. They are embracing diversity. They're pushing the envelope of what it means to be equitable. And they're trying to make sure everything's more accessible. And the thing to growth is change. And at the end of the day, if you take away anything else from this conversation, is that if you don't change, you don't grow. You literally cannot grow without change. Oh, well, we didn't used to do this back in the day. 25 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, pre-pandemic, none of this mattered as much as it, it just showed up. With... No, no, it's always been around. The thing is, the, the power has shifted. 
Mm. It's the consumers. It's mm-hmm. the audience. It's the community who's demanding higher standards, which means if we want to stay in business, if we want to still be in what we're trying to be, we have to meet those standards. Not be like, I'm just going to shun away and put it in, in, the, in the box somewhere and hope it doesn't come out. We have to meet people where they are. Yeah, I love how you frame it too around like, if you have a business and you want to stay relevant, competitive, and you want to generate revenue, who are you serving and meet their needs, right? I talk a lot on the show around like human-centered design. Who are the people whose problems you seek to solve with your product or service? And how can you find out what they want, what they need? What do they desire? What are their challenges? And you don't get that. Number one, you don't get it if you don't ask. You don't get it if you don't listen and you don't get it if you don't have a diverse team to try to solve this from diverse perspectives. You, you talked about how when you were growing up, Troy, that, uh, you know, your mother and father had different skill sets and they both, you know, challenged you to grow in different ways. And, and then through that growth, obviously, engineering is not for the faint of heart, as you said. And an engineering mindset is... Um, It's a unique mindset. It's an analytical mindset. It's a problem-solving mindset. There's a belief and an optimism that things can be created. And when you take that mindset and you apply it to business, we see a lot. My, um, it's like my god, my godfather's granddaughter graduated from great school with an engineering degree. All she wanted to be was an engineer. First year out of school, where did she go? Deloitte to be a consultant because they wanted her mind. They say we just want people that can solve problems and look at it a certain way and think a little bit differently. And so as you bring your engineering mindset through all the things you've done, a growth hacker, a marketer, a speaker, I mean, again, for folks, man, just look, look them up, look up Troy, look them up and you'll see the, the first thing you're going to see, there's pictures of him on stage all over the world, right? Because that's what you do. You help inspire, uh, you help motivate and you help educate people on how to do, whether it's marketing and growth hacking. And now with, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging, um, that this is the work that you're doing. So my next question here is we talked about listening. We talked about asking. We talked about not, you know, why we do it for the right reasons and wrong reasons. This is like a a pretty, I don't know if it's a tough question, but we know that things change, right? Uh, We used to eat on the food guide pyramid, which was like, eat as much bread and pasta (laughs) as you can. Oprah still (laughs) says she loves bread and I'm holding on to that Oprah. (laughs) Now we're like, you know, there's whole segments of the population like bread is the enemy. Don't eat bread. So things change, right? But, But if you're using that analogy of like, our food habits have changed. Our dietary, you know, um, frameworks have changed, but it's still wrapped in this idea of like health and wellness, right? So as we think about the 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 timeline from somebody becoming aware of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging to starting to learn how to implement it, like the 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 best players in the world that are doing this with authenticity. What does it look like in the workplace? Is it is it like a passive mindset that like people just over time are like hey, are we thinking about this the right way? Are our teams assembled the right way and now we're looking at problems through a diverse lens? Or is it more like a, um, you know, like in the world of software development, there's frameworks like agile and lean frame. Like, are there steps to this process? What does it look like when you're doing it at the highest level? In a perfect world, not only is the physical representation applicable, we're talking even the technology, your tech stack, what you use. Are we diverse and what tools that we use representative of the culture we're trying to create, which probably could shake a whole bunch of people up because you're like, I have never thought who owns certain technology that I use in my business. And is that reflective of who I am as a culture of my organization and the benefit to the very audiences that I impact? That's like three level take level, like, whoa. Okay. Right, right, right. And if we can just sit with that for a minute, we can for those who are listening and watching and whatever. But I think, Frameworks, yes. I think who you hire, who you interact with, who you consult with, who you partner up with, what initiatives you do, yes. But I premise by saying, take a deep breath and do with when the capacity you are able to do, because we do live in a world in 2024 where there's still prejudice and racism and discrimination and hatred and When you do this work, you try to apply this work, you have to be wise. That's not saying don't have zeal, but that's saying know how to maintain your zeal and walk in wisdom 
when you're applying these things because the worst thing you can do is blindly be bold and try to change the very fabric of how your business has been successful up to this point to reflect what you feel in your heart, which is good. Um, the change, however, you haven't naturally grown your audience and your consumers, your partners and everything else around you to this change, which can dramatically impact your financial income and your revenue and all these other things. So we don't want you to go, you know, zero to 100 real quick, like Drake would say, and then it all falls apart in like a month because you didn't prime your audience and move with wisdom and slowly integrating and implementing what you can, especially if, let's say, you are not a non BIPOC set organization or leader, but you do want to embrace these same principles. It's different. It's different for everybody in every situation. So now that that's being said, you really want to start with who can I bring in to set the stage? We can't just teach ourselves this. <laughs> This bring is something you, right? you need to bring like, in people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge advocate. I, I, I talk about this all the time at work to like meeting facilitation. It's a skill set. Bring in the professionals. Right. People are like, oh, we're going to brainstorm. It's like, no, you're not because you're not a professional. Get the professional to get the professional outcome. So what you're saying here is for folks that want to bring in a professional, if this is something that is that you, uh, hopefully everybody understands why this is valuable to their business, to their lives, bring in a professional. And what do professionals do in this space? Well, the first thing I want to acknowledge, <laughs> having a third party vessel eliminates tension within the group. Because mm -hmm. you can put all the blame, all the tension on that person who was built to facilitate right. and negate that. That's the one thing. That's the first, as a leader, bring someone in who can handle it. Oh, this makes me feel comfortable. Well, that's a facilitation's, facilitator's job. Right. And they're skilled at that. It's important to note, people, <laughs> they, we are trained. We are researched. We, are, we practice, right? Like this is our craft is not yeah. building widgets. Our craft is getting the group to align and finding the challenges. Uh, yes. So bring in a professional because I think one thing I really hear you saying is it kind of takes the edge off the group a little bit and it removes yeah. that tension within the kind of internal group. And then two, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's kind of like you ask someone who's sitting there quiet. And you ask them something and they don't want to say nothing. And you get them to start talking and they don't stop. What's amazing is you start, the questions may seem very uncomfortable at the beginning. But once everyone kind of gets comfortable and the vulnerabilities start coming out, oh my gosh. Snowballing, man. It's a retreat <laughs> heaven over here. <laughs> you know what this work is? I feel that, again, having sat in so many of, of sessions like this with trained, facilitating things like this. Um, we often say, I know we're here today to talk about, and again, when I was doing uh, you know, innovation consulting, we're here today to solve a business problem. This is really therapy. That's what this is. It is business therapy because that, again, when you break down the barriers, when you get the conversation flowing, it becomes therapeutic to people. They say things that they've been holding in. They ask questions they've been you know, nervous to ask, and it really is a therapeutic approach to, to making people align on things. No, 100%. And I think the other thing to think about when you're trying, whether you're trying to improve your marketing, you're trying to improve your creative, be more reflective, um, all these different things, you know, it's also like, it's okay to have a little fire. Because that's going to purge impurities. You, you can't make mm. this transform without a little heat to reshape, literally reshape and align the minds and the hearts and make sure it's reflective of who you're working with, who you're trying to partner with. And amazing, once you break down those walls, it makes it easier to sell your products and services. It makes it easier to do marketing. You're not just looking at the data from how many people click this, how many people watch this. Why? Like, where's the neuropsychology behind this? DIBA is not just, you know, line them up. Again, we're not trying to just assemble the Power Rangers here. Right. This is a gateway to the next level of how you do business in an equitable way that you're doing in a way that's right. It's sure we can, many people have grown businesses, probably the most unhealthy of ways possible. And I'm sending prayers to all my entrepreneurs out here because y'all already know. <laughs> but if we can still have that same mentality and success in a way that's 
flowing more easily in a way. And because the thing is, if we only know one way to do something, we never can consider, is there an easier way to do this? Is there, you know, one of the, I'll say, I'll share this. This has nothing to do with this, but it's going to make sense. Mm -hmm. I've built a lot of websites in my lifetime for brands and other companies growing up and very young. Do you, you know, when the one day I'll realize, because I would, I would, the website would be down on Friday and I got until Monday morning to build this whole new website from start to finish and work 40, you know, 36 hours trying to get this done. Why don't you just um, put it to another subdomain? build it all up. And once you're done, you just trash the domain and it takes, you know, five to 24 hours and then it's done. I never thought of that. I did not know. I'm going through this, the hardest, and I take great pride in the agony. Oh, and the, man. Why oh. do that? It's we the same pride. thing with this. Yeah, if we take pride in a badge of honor and all the wrong things, right? Like I was all a public school thing. teacher. Public school teachers take more pride than anybody. Like I spend my own money. I stay late. I give up my weekends. It's like, you don't have to, right? Like maybe there's another way to do it, right? Or like, oh my God, this is the worst analogy. I cook all the food in my house. I'm the chef in the house. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. I do all the cooking. I t I'm such a psycho. I want the protein to come out right at the right temperature when the, when the vegetables are ready. Everything's got to be perfect. And then, uh, and, and one thing is I cook a lot of salmon. My wife's a pet. She doesn't eat on, now. meat, right? So, so I'm like salmon. I got to pan sear the salmon. Ooh. Then I finish it in the oven and it comes out. It's got this nice crisp and the insides. Got, she loves it. Right. But then we got an air fryer and you could put the salmon in the air fryer and in eight minutes. It's cooked perfectly, but I don't have the, I don't have the pride and like, but I seared it perfectly in the pan. And then, and it's like, I'm taking pride in all the wrong shit, man. It's like, man. if there's an easier way to do it, you could do it easier and then invoke your pride and your effort and elsewhere. And I'm sorry to take us on that, on that long path. I'm using that air fryer analogy now, cause that just changed dude, the whole game. Like, dude, uh, we could just do an air fryer. Yeah, yeah. I use air fryer all, every day, all day, all day. It's like when the microwave came around. All right. So what, what I hear you saying though, is like, as it relates to this work and the work that the companies do, we kind of take pride in like, the, 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 the hard, the, the effort, the hardness. And it's like, it doesn't need to be that way. You can think differently, do things a little bit differently. And then it opens up all your time, your creative energy units and, and your mind space, your head space to do the work. So what's the analogy here for when people are, are starting to incorporate this into their work? Where, where do we see like that lift come from? Like you said, bring in a professional, have them help you with it. But as the work gets going, what's that subdomain? Where does that kind of uh, come in? I think it comes in when you, when people start to believe what they're doing is actually working before they see the results. That's true. What in the world do you mean by that? In order for this to really work, and again, we're the king of analogy right now because that's all we know how to, to do. So I'm just riffing off what you're doing right now. You start off a season, pick your team, NFL, NBA, whatever, mm -hmm. hockey, whatever. You have to believe you're going to be a champion at the very beginning. You have to believe it's possible and get everyone aligned to pursue this long, treacherous season despite everything in the hopes that you're going to. You have to do that then. Not halfway through, not when you finally get to the playoffs, not when you get to the finals. You have to believe in that in that moment as you're working on it. I won't say the F word of faith, but if you are <laughs> aligned with it, sure. If you're not, yeah. universe, karma, goodwill, whatever you want to associate, trying to be inclusive to all here in this moment. But you have to get everyone in the belief and alignment that this is the way. We may not have it all together yet. It may not be perfect. We may fail at times, we may have tension, but that's all part of the process, just like working out. You're going to feel sore some days, you ain't, but over time, it's going to stack up and it's going to work. And so the facilitation, we, we fast forward, the facilitation is over. You have built a custom plan. You have identified the challenges, the obstacles, the goals, the wants. You've done your SWOT analysis. You've done your people analysis. You know, your audience, you've done all these different things. You have all these stacks of paper and digital documents and links associated with everybody. Anyway. Everything's already done. <laughs> okay, we, we've, we fast forward probably like six to eight months worth of work. Here. Right, right, right. Now we're here. Now here's the hardest part is to slowly integrate that into your daily navigations and conversations. You know, people, 
for the longest time had the hardest resistance to adding he, him, his in their email sequence mm-hmm. in, you know, maybe uh, Zoom calls or even if we have badges or things where right. you're at a different events. And they made it because they didn't understand the significance of why that mattered because the oppressed group to why that mattered to so much didn't have the megaphone to acknowledge and for you to experience why that mattered so much. Stay with that for a minute. And so we go further and we're doing our marketing, our creative. And now you're seeing people trying to be more inclusive and who we bring to the table. I had just shared in another talk, $3.7 trillion in generational buying power for BIPOC is available. And people are refusing to modify their creative to be more inclusive, more equitable, more diverse not only in their representation, but who they sell to, because they still think under the notion people of color may not have the same equivalency of buying power than somebody else. Wow. And hmm, instead of me having to create a whole new MVP, I can just expand my marketing creative and my personas to be more inclusive and reflective of other people. And I may get anywhere between 12 to 26% increase in growth simply by doing that. That's like one of the easiest things to do. We don't have to create anything new. We're just expanding on the necessity to who it helps the most. Little gems here. Yeah, yeah. And but you know? it, it, it all goes back to one thing. People. Yes. The people doing the work. The people, who are you trying to serve? Whose problems are you trying to solve? What, and, and again, hey, if you're like, hey, man, I care about one thing. My P and L. That's all I care. Fine. If you care about your P and L, there's still people buying your products. How do you get to those people, right? So I think there's a lot of pathways there, but I think that the all roads to success are laid. Uh, you know, th- all roads to success are paved with people. The work of like understanding people. Who are you? Who are you working with? Who are you working for? Who are you trying to solve problems for? Focusing on people. And again. Right. One thing that like, I've, I kind of keep hearing come up, Troy, and you, you say it so well, this, this is why you do what you do, uh, is that it's, the, it's a learning opportunity, right? If you're not learning, you're not growing. And if you're not changing, you're not growing. So being open enough to a new perspective, being open enough to set aside your bias, being open enough to listen actively, just being open as a human once you're open, a lot of great things can happen. But when we're closed off and we just do things the way we've always done them and we, we're, we're not um, and we are resistance to change, it's kind of a recipe for disaster. And you know what? You're not lying. I think it's it's kind of it's kind of easy to be nice. <laughs> you know, like it's much easier. It's, it's, to be nice. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of effort to be a dick. Um, so, <laughs> Troy, you are working uh, again. You've done so much in your career already, and in my opinion, you're just getting started. I think people like you and I kind of like they're gonna like take us out of the nursing home for board meetings or whatnot. Uh, but um, there's a new thing that happened, a new venture that you started very recently, um, and the story behind how it started is really fascinating. Will you tell people uh, about season three media, how it started, what it is, what you're doing? Because I am a I'm a big lover of it. I'm a big believer in it. I'm a fan of it. Um, it's it's one of the things that, um, like, when I see a, a Grateful Dead symbol somewhere, like, out in the wild, it makes me happy. I feel good, right? When I see a skateboard, I feel good. When I see When I see what you're doing, it makes me feel good. It resonates in an experiential level. Because it's off, it's the most authentic thing I've seen in a long time. So tell people without me blabbing anymore. Talk about season three. How did it start? Well, for starters, I always get asked, you know, what does season three mean? And this isn't something I came up with. This is what my uh, business partner, Christina K came up with and was resonating with her. The season three moniker, it, it means the moment of trans- transformation, you know, when an athlete breaks through, you know, Kobe before he became Kobe, MJ before he became MJ, Gretzky before he became Gretzky, like, you know, Caitlin Clark before she became Caitlin Clark on her way to becoming the great Caitlin Clark. You know, Curry, they're breaking those plateaus to that season three era where everything is just clicking and transforming to be who you need to become to achieve what you need to achieve. And that area, that zone is season three. 
And so we've taken that and we've embodied that in who we are. We're both minorities. We both have lived some tough lives and yet we still want to give and we still want to impactful. Now we have both um, have been in this growth game. Like Christina is one of the OGs in HubSpot. She knows MarTech better than most run laps about most, you know, I, I'm willing to bet she got it. You know what I'm saying? I've done in the go to market and growth strategy side. And so we've been in the corporate side. We've been on the agency side. We made a lot of folk, a lot of money, but now we're like, well, we want to obviously make money, <laughs> please. But we also want to do it in a way that's reflective of where we are in our careers and who we want to serve. We are tired of not just making money. I want to help people connect with communities at scale, not just from a number play, but an equitable way. Mm -hmm. We want to educate people on better marketing practices. We want to help you create your tech stack that's not only fluid, and optimize for sales pipeline optimization, but also that's reflective of, hey, what if I just told you you can increase your sales by just being better humans reflective in your copy and who you talk to? That takes training. We can't assume everyone knows how to do that. Again, now, it's a skill. Yeah. It's, it's a skill. It's, there's experts in this field. You're the experts in the field. It's kind of like I wouldn't go out and try to like – go camping on my own. Cause I don't know anything about camping. I need help. I'm not, I need a bear an grip, man. I'm, I'm not gonna make it. <laughs> no, no. I'm more like the bear in Chicago, you know, like the, the, the movie well, show. You're probably that, better than Chicago bears, but they come <laughs> come up. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> Anybody's better than them. So bring in the experts. That's what you're, you're doing at season three. And I always say, you know, for us, we're forever students. Again, I'm stacking layers. Even now still, every experience is different. I come in from that humility space because i know every group every situation is different and so season three is what we're doing now we're kind of doing two or three different buckets we have you know our advisory where we're serving as fractional service providers um helping those who need flexibility in their marketing and sales creative media all that jazz and then what our what we really love to do for those who know we've co-hosted inbound and we've done a lot of things we love the inbound community host by community Black and inbound. I love all y'all. Y'all, y'all, the reason I'm here today. Um, we love that. We are extroverts at heart who care and are performers naturally. Um, I'm a former theater kid. She's forever a cheerleader at heart, cheerleader right, right. currently. So we both had that dynamic, dynamic, big energy and connectivity. And for all y'all know, with events, it drains the mess out of you. <laughs> and so we're just like the energizer of just keep giving energy. And we can just last all day, like, you know, Captain America, we can do this all day. And so we're trying to merge improving marketing, sales, and pipeline optimization technology. Couple that with events, whether in the physical sense, social, or digital sense. And we really do believe those are reflective ways to express and connect in a broad sense. You know, not everyone can be an inbound event, not to make inbound the, the pinnacle, but right. not every event has the manpower, the woman power, the time, and the intention to ask and reflect and refine to be better, more inclusive, more accessible experience. You have to prove that costs money. That costs time. So but if you do it right, team. you can now cash it in for more value than you could have had. Talking about legacy level, high level loyalty, brand equity, relationships development, where the word of my mouth is 10 times better than what it was before by making it more immersive and inclusive. But people need to learn how to do that and tie that into revenue still. We're still trying to make everybody money. I don't want anyone to say, well, I invested in DEIBA and uh, I ain't, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. You see the, the recipe wrong. The recipe was right. You just made it wrong. <laughs> We're trying to make sure that more brands, there's a better way to do business be more human centric, not just put it in ChatGPT and put out fancy words on the website, call it a day. No, we want to make sure you got the receipts and that you're doing the real it. work. Okay? Right. People like us, we see it. We see the website. We're like, bullshit. Like we can, we can smell it a mile away. We know, like we said, the stock images, we know it. We know it when we see it. Again, it gets to this, this deep human core level that like, 
I don't even need to read it. I can smell it from a mile away. I can feel it when it's in my area. And so I think you're right, man. It's like, it's not just the recipe. It's how we make it. It's why we make it. And the return on investment, again, you're very clear on this. And I want to applaud you on that. Some folks will come on and or in the world, they'll be like, hey, I just want to make the world a better place. I just want everyone to feel the right. It's like you're saying, yes, and we can make money. It's the ethos of I can do good while I'm doing well, right? Or I can right. do well, meaning like I can do good business, but I can do good things in the world. Those, these things don't need to be mutually exclusive. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to earn some money and generating revenue. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's a lot of ways to do it. What I hear you saying loud and clear, and for anybody that, that is listening, an easy way, sorry, I shouldn't say an easy way. One way is to start being more human to listen, to actively listen, to seek out diverse perspectives, to bring in a professional to help you do this work. And nine times out of 10, you will see the return on investments within your people that are doing the work in your company. You'll see the return on investments on your P&L as your revenue starts to increase. And I can tell you that just being have some, as someone that's done so much different transformative work across organizations, those two things, the revenue increase, the kind of culture of the people changing, it creates a flywheel. It creates a flywheel of innovation and change. People now see, hey, we got more change to happen. Where else can we start to change? Where can we start to think a little bit differently about things we're doing? And so it's almost like a, uh, it's a 10Xer. It's a 10Xing approach. It's a growth hacking. Uh, I don't want to say it's a growth hacking, but it, it is truly a growth lever that folks should be pulling. And for folks who need examples, uh, the two that comes to mind that screams to me, one not as recent but still just as impactful, was Dove. When they emphasized you are beautiful and they showed all genders, all skin types, we're not here. We're here to make you clean and align with your beauty that you already have. One of the most powerful, I don't like to say the V word, but most viral campaigns, but it had a legacy pendulum and how Dove did in his marketing ever since. Not everyone got to be a Wendy's, y'all. Mm -hmm. People want to reference always Wendy's. We can have the same dynamite effect, if not more, with love. And what you say, Mark, being nice humans. And the other one, I think about, you know, that everyone's kind of done with it, the virality now. Um, Stanley. Oh, my I mean, God. who were they doing before? And all it took was someone to say, you know what? We're not inclusive. You know, if we just expanded who we targeted, who we spoke to, and added value to, not only did it soar you up, it literally made you a ton of money. I want to, I have to find the article. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes. It was, it was the, the kind of case study of how, what they did pre Stanley water thing. Like w I yeah. think what happened was there was like an influencer was like, this is such a great cup. And they're like, wait, we're going to start leaning in there. And they went from this very niche segment of like the working, you know, trades, trade people that were on the job with the thermos. And they're like, wait, what's happening over here? And, and again, the data is through the roof of the return on investment. That company has grown, I mean, quadrupled in revenue just from that one kind of opportunity and, and realization to lean into a new segment. And this is meant to immediately see, um, yes, diversity can drive revenue, but I don't want you to think, oh, I'm going to be in this business and look at it from the wrong lens. We're, there's the multiple things of source of truth that can be true at the same time. Diversity does allow you to drive more revenue. Inclusion does allow you to be more innovative. But we have to look at it from the right integral lens of integrity and human-centric approach. But knowing that if we do it right, all the other dominoes will align and will work out in our favor. So we're playing the short game and the long game at the same time. But no, one small change can make a big ripple effect in your business and how you perform it and your marketing strategy and all those things. But you need help to do it. And the right lens is a DIBA lens. And you're going to actually see, imagine, again, we just put a filter in front of the screen. <laughs> and imagine you just start saying, oh, there's money. Oh, there's money. Oh, there's yeah. money. Oh, there's money. Oh, my goodness. Oh, and I can do it all by just being a good human and creating content that people want to see and hear and know and reflective of their own identities and pain points and joys. What? Who would have thought? Something so simple. The best things in life have been the most simplest things that it took years for people to figure out and create because they're too stubborn to see through on their own eyes. 
That's what we're asking and challenging and acknowledging for you to do so. DIBA. Mic drop. Applause. Standing ovation. Amazing. I'm biting my tongue because I'm thinking now and I just need to put it on paper and I'll probably hit you up after this podcast, but something's on my mind. Um, Let's go. Folks, if you're listening, and again, Aunt Cindy, Aunt Terry on the East Coast, I know you're listening as well. Business leaders across the world, I know you're listening as well. And everybody from entrepreneurs and artists to doctors and designers are all listening. Please go check out Season 3 Media. Reach out to Troy. You can find him online at, at Find Troy on all your socials. Um, what you heard here today is what you're going to hear when you jump on a call or a Zoom or you get a coffee with him. He is a kind, genuine, insanely intelligent person that again is learning changing and growing throughout his career and is helping you figure out how you can do that for your business and in your life troy this was worth the wait i don't want to wait much longer till we do it again man thank you so so much anything real quick before we jump off i hope people will go to the website i hope they reach out to you is there anything you need help with that the audience can help you with we try to get clients y'all we try to be change agents out here Okay. And so if you do need some event hosts, MCs for your upcoming event tours, we down. If you need fractional services for your fractional CMO or sales, we down. And if you need training in this work to make your marketing operations and sales and tech stack better, we're here to help. Season3media.com. Let us know. We're here. Bam. Put a bow on it. Episode over. Troy, sending you love from Chicago all the way to Indianapolis. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, brother. This beats me at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wild one, man. Uh, thank you so much. All right, brother.